Viva Bitcoin, Crypto, Crypto, Blockchain! Hola! <laughs> Bitcoin, vai, 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 su! <laughs>um, I it's it's still a little early in New York, so I'm drinking a uh, milk stout brewed with coffee. And I don't drink beer, sorry guys, uh, but we need to drink spritz a lot. So. Awesome. Well, cheers guys. Cheers. Cheers. Chin chin. Welcome to the show. So everyone is having to adapt to these quite strange times we live in now and Cointelegraph is uh, no exception. So we also had to start working from home, as you can see. And uh, Jay, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, how the company had to adapt to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Sure. So Cointelegraph is already a global company. So, you know, we're pretty used to working across time zones and coordinating on video calls and Slack and things like that. Um, but it's definitely been a challenge, uh, you know, having everyone work from home. I think people are, you know, rightfully a little anxious right now and, uh, you know, just trying to cope with that. Here in New York, uh, I live in Brooklyn. Um, you know, it took people a little while to, uh, to sort of start complying with the lockdown and, and staying indoors. But uh, now, I mean, the streets, my block is completely empty. There are literally no cars on my block. And, you know, a month ago I had friends visiting and it was impossible for them to find anywhere to park. So it's it's totally changed in just a matter of weeks. People have fled the city and uh, the people that are here are just not leaving their house. And Christina, you're kind of in the thick of it, right? Over uh, in Italy. What's it, what's it like over there? Well, we've been locked for four weeks now, almost. Sunday, that will be the anniversary. Uh, well, I would say that it's definitely a tough experience, um, especially from the psychological point of view, because yes, we are all used to work at home uh, and uh, we kind of uh, used to use digital, digital tools. Uh, that is not the case of so many people now, so many different professions, but uh, we are locked from going outside. Um, all our trips and conferences were cancelled. I actually was going to join Jay in New York uh, this spring, but it was cancelled as well. Uh, and um, it's very different, difficult for me personally to like divide sometimes work and private life and offline and re online, offline reality. Um, but we are trying to adapt. Uh, we are also trying to incentivize our team uh, by being more, uh, but by sharing experiences. And actually, we've just published an article with different um, stories from reporters and editors all over the world how they are coping with this very unusual situation. Uh, so if you want to know more about our team, uh, please check the article. Um, I also experienced a lot more of uh, digitalization in different parts of life. So virtual events uh, have become something that we experience every day. Um, uh, we, I also per personally launched a digital dancing platform in order to keep uh, myself informed. Um, so yeah. And internet is doing great, even though in, in Italy, the load on internet connection has been, I don't know, tripled, maybe more, but uh, it's doing great. So thank you for all internet providers <laughs> in the country. I mean, even in New York, the internet's been uh, been overloaded and, uh, you know, it's it's been definitely a lot of people both working from home and, and just streaming Netflix all day long. But, I, you know, I should add that, you know, Cointelegraph, we're really lucky to still be able to keep working through this, to all have our jobs and to get to, you know, keep serving our readers and our audience uh, through this difficult time. Cool. And uh, so, Jackson, what do you miss the most about uh, the pre-quarantine period? <laughs> Um, 
I mean, I miss going outside on a daily basis. <laughs> don't you miss you know, uh, don't you miss having beers with me uh for our classical beer and bitcoin show? I do well, we're still having beers right now, man, but I do miss seeing your lovely face in person. Yeah, the same here. <laughs> what about you, Giovanni? What do you miss the most? I, I have a few answers I could say for you, but uh, I'll let you do them. Well, I also miss contact with people because I love uh, I love being in direct touch with people, and I'm still kind of getting used to this kind of virtual uh, way of communicating. Uh, it's not it's not the same, unfortunately, but. Uh, yeah, better than nothing, better than nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a change in lifestyle for, for us as well. I mean, you can see that we're, we're here at home now. We're not in the studio anymore. So uh, just adjusting to that to that lifestyle is, 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 has been uh, challenging. But like Jay said before, it's a, it's a privilege to still be able to work. So I'm happy that we're doing the things that we're doing now. Uh, and it's, it's a good way to move forward. Jackson, do you have a, uh, do you have a little studio set up there? Uh, in, in your apartment? I I have a light, a camera, and two computers, and a microphone. Uh, if that constitutes a studio, then I guess the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> personally, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it does, but I'm looking to acquire another light, you know, mm -hmm. to get this side of my face a little bit brighter. But uh, yeah, for now, we're just kind of working with what we've got at the moment. Yeah, I think that's true for everyone. Well, everybody really stay safe and uh, also... Keep your mind healthy. That's important because it's it's not a it's not a usual experience to be locked down. But we need to be strong, strong and everything will be great. And drink beer. Yeah. Cheers to that. Cheers. So moving on to the crypto news of the month. During the worldwide market crashes of March 12th to 13th, which is already becoming known as Black Thursday, Bitcoin lost over 50% of its price. March 12th was the worst day for Bitcoin in the last seven years. It lost over 40% of its price in 24 hours. Global stock markets also suffered one of their worst days ever. Italy was hit the hardest with the FTSE MIB and Borsana Italiana falling nearly 17%. This was a significant moment because it proved a strong correlation between movements in equity markets and in Bitcoin, something that Professor Harvey Campbell had pointed out at the end of February. Bitcoin, Ethereum, other cryptos are more in the category of risk assets. That means they will move uh, in big uh, systemic events like other risk assets like stocks. The correlation held for all of March as Bitcoin mirrored most major moves in the global stock markets. Uh, you can see these on dates March 8th, 9th, 16th, and the 20th. Um, other exports began to pick up this correlation. Matty Greenspan tweeted that in times of stress, all correlations go to one. And he pointed out in one of our recent market discussions that Bitcoin had a 0.6 correlation with the stock market and a 0.1 correlation with gold. What do you guys make of this correlation that has been coming out between Bitcoin and the stock market over the month of March? Well, okay, my correlation point is that the fact that crypto um, goes down together with all other markets does mean that crypto is part of the world economy. And that is at the same time a bad point, but also a good one, because actually we can see that uh, it experiences the same um, phenomena that all the world economy uh, does. So I think we are living all together and crypto is now uh, indispensable part of, of the economy all over the world. Yeah, I think it's indicative of, uh, you know, how, how much Bitcoin and crypto more broadly have been adopted into, you know, general economic life and how much we have, you know, uh, traditional investors taking part in speculation on crypto assets. Uh, you know, there was a tweet from Michael Del Castillo at Forbes that I really liked about the crash. You know, he said, uh, Bitcoin isn't magic. It behaves the way its owners behave. When normal people around the world buy it because they're afraid, it goes up. When traditional investors sell it because they're behaving like they always do in a crisis, it goes down. Nothing has changed. I think that's really, really true. I mean, you had a lot of 
likely you know traditional money in bitcoin that panic sold during the crash because they were panic selling everything but then the fact that bitcoin recovered so strongly is also indicative of where it sort of differentiates from the wider economy and there are some people that are looking at it as a as a safe haven asset i think it's i, I think part of what's going on is you can't really have a, a uniform holistic uh, view of what Bitcoin is right now, because there are lots of people trying to get lots of different things out of it. So it's going to behave somewhat erratically because there's not people, a group of people that have all have consensus on what exactly it is and how to use it. I kind of agree with Jay when uh, he's, he pointed out the, um, the young age of Bitcoin. I think that it's still a very young asset. And uh, so it's very difficult right now to predict how it reacts to specific events. But uh, I think that with the passage of, of time, people will get a better idea of uh, his behaviors and that's probably it's going to become more, more stable as, a, as an asset, more predictable at least. Yeah, those are some really good points. And Jay brought up the idea of Bitcoin, one of those narratives surrounding Bitcoin, which is the uh, safe haven asset that Bitcoin could become. And a lot of people are putting a lot of weight on this current financial crisis in creating this narrative. Mike Novogratz, for example, the CEO of Galaxy Digital, says that Bitcoin will continue to be volatile over the next few months, but the macro backdrop is why it was created. This will be and needs to be Bitcoin's year. Dan Moorhead, the CEO of Pantera Capital, another big venture capitalist firm in the crypto space, also said that Bitcoin was born in a financial crisis and it will come of age in this one. However, some academics are skeptical about Bitcoin's viability as a store of value. Ariel Zetlin Jones, Associate Professor of Economics at Carnegie Mellon, does not see Bitcoin becoming a store of value in the long run, saying that Bitcoin is one of the riskiest stores of value in the world, with Bitcoin price volatility more than five times that of gold or even U.S. equity prices. Um, what are, are you guys... How involved are you guys in this safe haven asset? I know we talked about uh, there being many different narratives along with Bitcoin. Uh, do you see that Bitcoin will break away from the equity markets and uh, decouple this correlation that we were talking about earlier? I mean, I'm not really one for predictions personally. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. as a journalist, I look at, I try to just report what's going on and analyze it as much as I can. And, you know, now as editor of Cointelegraph, I'm you know, overseeing a bunch of really smart journalists and editors who are doing that themselves. But I think the points that, you know, that you read from Mike Novogratz and Dan Moorhead are really kind of crucial because, you know, this is exactly the scenario that Bitcoin was created for. You have, you know, the, the Fed money printer meme going around right now. And, you know, the Fed is printing money. And uh, this is why Bitcoin true believers say that Bitcoin is a superior store of value or a superior currency. Uh, so if this isn't Bitcoin's year, if Bitcoin doesn't take off this year, then I think that's actually kind of a problem for Bitcoin because it means that it's missing something in terms of what its core value proposition is supposed to be. So how much time do you give Bitcoin to, to show this, uh, these properties? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, well, it depends on the wider economy, of course. Uh, what were you going to say, Jackson? Well, I recently spoke to Dave Weisberger, who's the CEO of CoinRoutes, and he said that um, it's more about what happens in this crisis. I mean, this crisis could take years to resolve. Exactly. But really what happens in this crisis is the, the event itself is what's going to define Bitcoin. And, you know, one of the arguments against Bitcoin becoming a safe haven is that uh, it has, it's very volatile. It is more volatile than almost any other asset out there. And But he had a very interesting perspective on this, and he was saying that, Uh, is not about short-term volatility with Bitcoin because once Bitcoin reaches high market caps like the market cap of gold, that volatility is going to be much reduced. Uh, we're not going to see that same kind of price fluctuations or at least the percentage difference isn't going to be as high. What really matters, and this is what Jay, I think, touched on earlier, is the critical mass of acceptance. You know, Are people using it? Do people believe in it? Do they trust in it? And this crisis will hopefully reveal Uh, whether people can trust this hard asset in the midst of all of this money printing that's going on with the central banks. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Jackson. And I think that uh, people should trust crypto not only as a store of value, but also as means of payment. And this is critical for adoption and for uh, development of crypto as a part of our everyday lives. 
as a person who uh, follows different uh, platforms where you can pay with crypto, I could say that it's definitely something that is being developing um, more and more actively. Uh, I don't know, I, I talked about dance before. We have a tango uh, school here in my city that is uh, accepting crypto for payments. Uh, that's in my, in my opinion, it's incredible because it's a little city and uh, uh, actually, two years ago, nobody know, knew what is crypto, and now uh, there is this opportunity to pay with crypto even in places that like are not associated with fintech or innovative industry. Yeah, I, I think that's very indicative of the kind of science we want to be watching out for as Bitcoin's uh, Bitcoin's journey evolves. You know, how is it being used? Where is it being used? And when is it not correlating with other risky assets that are that are making big movements in the markets? So for all of you viewers out there who are curious and wondering what you can look at to see how the Bitcoin narrative is evolving, those are some key factors you can keep an eye on. Long live Bitcoin. <laughs> Long live Bitcoin. <laughs>to add that uh, Cointelegraph just launched an Instagram mask where you can find out which crypto are you. Uh, so I, for example, found out yesterday that I'm Bitcoin and I'm happy to be Bitcoin. Uh, but if you want to check yourself which coin are you, check Instagram of Cointelegraph. This is Professor from Cointelegraph and I'm excited to learn that I am Bitcoin! <laughs> <laughs>March 12, the market crash impacted the DeFi space, the decentralized finance space, and specifically, it caused the meltdown of one of the biggest platforms on, in the space, which is uh, MakerDAO. MakerDAO found itself with uh, over $4 million uh, uh, outstanding debt because of the crash. So why is that important? That is important because MakerDAO is the largest uh, um, application, the largest platform on the, in the decentralized finance space. And, uh, um, it, the stable coin that it issues, the DAI, is powering many other applications on, in decentralized finance. So if uh, MakerDAO goes down, the whole, uh, uh DeFi space uh, goes down with it. So, <clears throat> just to, just to explain a little bit how it works. So MakerDAO is a lending platform, a decentralized lending platform. Um, and um, it issues the DAI, which is a stable coin pegged one to one to the um, to the US dollar. So, if you are a user of MakerDAO, MakerDAO you can take out a loan from uh, MakerDAO, uh, a loan in DAI. DAI is the stable coin. Uh, in order to take out a loan, you uh, need to put uh, some Ethereum in a smart contract. The value of that Ethereum needs to be 150% higher than the uh, amount of DAI that you take out as a loan. That's called uh, over collateralization. It means that, uh, and it over collateralization uh, serves uh, the purpose for um, safeguarding the platform from possible fluctuation in the uh, in the price of Ethereum. So um, if uh, your if if your Ethereum goes below the 150 percent threshold, that triggers automatic liquidation of your collateral, unless you are ready to put some Ethereum um, to cover the losses. So that's pretty much how MakerDAO works. It's pretty complicated, but um, that's how it keeps uh, it keeps everything working and it keeps a very delicate balance. So on March 12, this delicate balance uh, was uh, kind of um, affected. Uh, why? Because uh, um, the price of Ethereum fell sharply, unprecedented. 30% of the price of Ethereum, uh, sorry, Ethereum f uh, lost 30% of its price in a matter of hours. Um, that was uh, that was the cause of many of the smart contracts on the MakerDAO platform to trigger the liquidation process simultaneously. And another problem was that the gas price of Ethereum skyrocketed and the Ethereum network uh, got congested. Those two factors uh, caused a bug in the MakerDAO uh, functioning, which uh, uh, caused uh, MakerDAO to find itself with this four over four million dollars uncollateralized DAI in the market. So the Ethereum uh, in this uh, 
in this contract got fully liquidated and uh, the system didn't get any die in return. That's why there were over four million dollars worth of uncollateralized die in the market. Why is that important? If so, such an am a big amount of die is uncollateralized, means that the peg to the, the, the peg of die to the US dollar might uh, uh, be compromised as well. And that can, can have catastrophic consequences on the DeFi space as a whole. So what did uh, MakerDAO did to face this crisis? What it did, it was uh, it announced an auction, a debt auction, in which uh, um, they sold the Maker tokens. The Maker token is basically a share in the MakerDAO system. They sold these Maker tokens in order to buy back the, f the $4 million uh, uncollateralized uh, DAI and they restabilized the system. So uh, at the end of the day, the auction uh, went fairly successfully and they managed to restabilize the system. But there is a but. So basically, um, even if, uh, the point is that uh, if, even if MakerDAO managed to restabilize the whole system, the people who lost his, their, their Ethereum, the, the people who uh, had their Ethereum liquidated have not been reimbursed yet. They haven't been refunded yet. And there is a, an ongoing debate in the community on whether these people should actually be reimbursed. So there are someone who say these people uh, took the risk. They should have known these people uh, should have been aware of the risk they were running. And that's why they shouldn't be reimbursed. Other people are saying that actually this is maker doubt fault because it wasn't able to handle a situation like the market crash on March 12th. So I would like to know, guys, what do you think about this issue? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I think it highlights the fundamental risk with using a an extremely volatile asset like Ethereum or any crypto asset as collateral for a loan. So you know, on the one hand, this is sort of a foreseeable risk, uh, you know, that there could be this kind of volatility that could cause people's positions to be liquidated. On the other hand, you know, I think people would say that what happened on March 12th, 13th was pretty exceptional. But, you know, you can argue over how much people should have been able to foresee that we were, you know, due for a recession anyway, um, and so on and so forth. I think the, the questions that remain are, you know, did the MakerDAO protocol function correctly and, and did it do enough to protect users uh, in this scenario? And I think that's what people are really uh, focusing on. Um, you know, we've published a lot of great articles over the past week, past couple weeks at Cointelegraph um, on this. You know, there was one earlier this week talking about a uh, crypto venture fund uh, that uh, won about 68% of all of the auction die um, that came in from the, the March 28th uh, auction. So, you know, there's a lot of movement happening right now to try to stabilize MakerDAO, but uh, it's still is uh, sort of teetering, I think, on what is going to happen next. And it's the faith people are going to put in it depends on reassuring them that something like this isn't going to happen again. Yeah, I would like to add that it's also media responsibility in covering these events very delicately because um, rumors of MakerDAO uh, shutting down uh, actually created a lot of panic in the market and it could definitely impact uh, the situation even more. Uh, we had an opportunity, our head of news uh, reached uh, Rune Christensen and uh, actually he was put in contact with uh, his team. So we followed all the discussions within Mike Dow, that community that were searching for solutions uh, because it's definitely a difficult situation to handle. And uh, it's important how quickly do the company react, but also it's very important how media cover um, the rumors that are appearing in the industry. Yeah, and actually, can I, if I can add on that, you know, another part of that is not just talking to the people at the top, like Rune, which is of course really important and uh, essential for us, but also, you know, we have reporters who are following discussions and debates that are going on on the MakerDAO forums, you know, and there's that there's a huge thread, you know, about you know, do we compensate? Uh, vault holders that were completely liquidated and that that's a massive thread right now um, and you know we're we're following that we're following debates like that um, so we're getting both input from the top of these organizations and from the ordinary users as well yeah so basically media serves as a mediator between different actors of the industry and uh, it's a very big responsibility on us because basically we 
accumulate different opinions, different problems, different issues, and well, try to just present them as objectively as we can. To me, uh, to me, this topic is uh, crucial regarding. I mean, uh, this MakerDAO meltdown has a huge impact on the reputation of the whole DeFi system. So it opened it opened the eyes on the fact that DeFi system, the DeFi infrastructure, is uh, relatively fragile and uh, fundamentally unprepared to face events like. Uh, the market crash on March 12. So that event was considered a black swan, so something that is unpredictable and cannot be predicted. But on the other hand, we, we are in the crypto system. We are in the world of very volatile assets. So I think that this kind of event should be taken in consideration. And I'd love to hear from our, our audience, you know, what they think MakerDAO could have or should have done differently as well. Um, I think that, that'd be a valuable point of input for us uh, as reporters and editors. So this week, the news came out that Binance has acquired CoinMarketCap. This is uh, a pretty big move. There were some numbers being thrown around about how big the deal actually was. It's unclear about what the exact figure was. But uh, for someone in the space making moves like this at this particular time, uh, it is a really interesting, interesting decision. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the big question is, you know, why did Binance want to acquire CMC? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's worth noting that Binance says, you know, OK, we're not going to start charging for listings on CMC. And um, they say, you know, we're not going to influence the rankings or try to manipulate trade volume or anything like that on CMC. At the same time, you know, for now, at least we kind of have to take their word on that. We can't confirm that we can't say what's going to happen in the future. Um, so, you know. At Cointelegraph, we're just going to continue, as always, to report the facts of what's going on there. Um, but in terms of why they acquired it, I mean, I think any exchange right now is trying to find ways to gain new users. And I, I, I would, if I had to speculate, I would say that, you know, they're hoping that they can convert people visiting CMC and sort of direct them towards Binance and make them become Binance customers and users. Yeah, definitely. Coin Market Cup has traffic, has data, and has experienced team. Um, so I think this is something that Binance uh, is always in search of uh, in the space. Uh, CZ and all his team uh, seem to be really people who um, who think a lot about the community and about different ways of uh, attracting more people into the space. Uh, of course, becoming their clients. Well, I'd say, you know, even even though we don't have the, the numbers confirmed, uh, you know, there are a lot of numbers circulating that I don't think are worth really paying attention to right now because there's nothing that's actually publicly disclosed or I think even sourced from any kind of, you know, formal, uh, you know, merger documents or anything like that. So, uh, you know, again, Cointelegraph, we're not, we're just going to report the facts of what's happened there. But I think what's notable, aside from the specific numbers, is that you have a major acquisition, regardless of the exact amount, happening right now in the middle of an economic crisis. And to go back to some of our earlier conversation today, that is somewhat indicative of, you know, the crypto economy being separate and somewhat resilient to these general market economic downturns. And so I think I think it's a pretty big deal that Binance went out and made this massive acquisition right now. You have an, an international multinational company making a, a massive merger play at a time. And I can't think of any other you know industry where that's happening right now. Certainly there are no airline companies or hotel chains you know, doing that at the moment. Yeah, but at the same time, I think that uh, it like it could have happened by inertia in, in the sense that it definitely had to start months if not years ago so uh, this is something that had to happen now uh, i would also like to highlight this little detail that uh, brandon chess who was founder of coin market cup actually stepped out as uh, uh, executive uh, top manager and uh, cmc's chief strategy officer became a ceo carolyn chan and I think it's a very interesting thing because Brandon, uh, who was uh, not at all public, who was a person that was definitely famous and he 
I imagine did made a lot of money uh, out of his project that went so well uh, and uh, he should be kind of young person uh, and he steps out uh, it, it also reflects a bit uh, in my opinion what's happening in the space that um, we already see that some generations change so even within our space that is so quick that is so young uh, we see already people who like got everything that they wanted and they just want to relax and to dedicate more time to, to families and their hobbies. Um, I think this is an interesting case uh, to think of. And uh, I'm really glad that the space has now one more uh, female CEO. Congratulations, Carolyn. Cheers to that. Yeah, I'll choose to that. Thank you everyone for watching. The Coin Telegraph editorial team wishes you a safe and healthy quarantine. If you like the video and you want to see more, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Stay safe and read Coin Telegraph. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Coin Telegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.